All right. So, Mr. Green, you're 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 addressing uh, this item. Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I've shared my screen. Can everybody see it? Yes. Okay. Um, again, Rick Green, Development Services Director. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. What I'd like to do is go through a uh, the quick background to explain to the commissioners how we got to the point we are at now. And there are really a couple instances that led us to uh, discussions of a modification of the special events ordinance. Um, beginning with the Ann Norton Sculpture Garden at 253 um, Barcelona Road, you see a, an aerial here of the Ann Norton Sculpture Garden. Um, a total of three buildings, two were built in 1925, one in 1945 approximately 6,000 square feet. The zoning is SF Fit 14 in the historic El Cid neighborhood. Um, just to the north of the N. Norton, you have the Palm Beach Day Academy School. And then further west on Barcelona and Flamingo, you have the Carefree Six site. We're working on an application that's been submitted to the city on that site. And as the commissioners had, had mentioned in the earlier discussion, you know, the problem has been when an event takes place, there's a great deal of parking on Barcelona and that has created a lot of issues, a lot of problems. Um, the Ann Norton Sculpture Garden has a series of events. These are just the sampling of some of the ones that took place um, late last year. Um, and these are ongoing throughout the year, it typically slows down in the summertime, but generally there are events that are taking place all the time. So just some pictures so you get um, recognition of what it looks like. In the top left corner, you see the um, Barcelona looking west from Flagler Drive, the Ann Norton facility is located on the right side. Just below that, it's the other direction looking east toward the Intracoastal. You see the Ann Norton at the end of the street on the left hand side. And then the larger picture on the right simply shows the Barcelona, Barcelona Road in configuration when you have cars parked on both sides. So you see how tight it can be on that particular street. And that's evident with a lot of the streets on the south end. Um, the second case that kind of got our attention was 717 Forest Hill Boulevard. Um, this is a property that's located north of the municipal golf course just east of the Forest Hill High School. Um, and like Ann Norton, there are a series of structures built in 1925, just under 3,700 square feet. And this is in our single family seven zoning district, which again is, is the least dense zoning district we have in the city. Um, and a layout of the, of the configuration of the buildings there, again, occupying more than a, than a couple lots. Um, if you go on the website, there's a gentleman who has a website called Events at the Rich Hippies House. They were advertising for four separate units, events over 17 people required to stay at the facility. And they were advertising weddings that could accommodate up to 125 persons. Um, so obviously, as the events were taking place and the weddings were ongoing, it was causing a lot of disruptions in the neighborhood. The owner was cited for multiple violations earlier this year in January for doing work without permits, didn't have proper business license, illegal events. Um, they were cited again on February 7th of this year for illeg illegally converting two of the units, which was permitted by zoning code to four units. Um, went to a special magistrate hearing on February 24th and a fine of $1,000 was imposed at that meeting. Um, and they were subsequently taken back to the federal, um, to the special magistrate on July 15th and a $10,000 fine was imposed because again, wedding events took place after that initial magistrate hearing on February 24th. So these are the two events that kind of caught our attention so having said that, we said it's time to maybe tighten up our special events ordinance a little bit stronger than what we've had. So that language is in the city code under chapter 78. You see the sections of the special events ordinance now. As part of the draft we are discussing tonight, we're including a section um, 78160, which addresses violations, enforcement, revocation of permits, um, and then the section 161, which is the appeal procedure. So again, you'll see this in more detail at a later date. Um, what we're giving you is just kind of an overview of what we've been discussing. Um, it will require city commission approval because it is an amendment to the city code. And we have been working very closely with community events, police, fire, law, building, parks and recreation and the public. So Mary Pennack, Angela Van, Eric Schneider, um, Stacy and Law, as well as Kimberly, um, a lot of folks have been commenting and providing us input. And that discussion will continue subsequent to this workshop. 
the big question that we would like to answer ask today of the commission is do we want to limit the number of special events on private property? And that'll be the prevailing theme as, as I go through the rest of this presentation. So some of the things that we will be doing as we are um, revising our definition section. So we'll have a better and stronger definition of what a special event is. And again, I'm not gonna ask the commission and the mayor to go through this item by item, but just to kind of give you a flavor of the things that we've been working on. So we're expanding the definition to talk about required street closing, closings, utilizing city property above normal usage, um, trying to define special events as 50 or more people, um, talking about the, un, unlike the customary or, or usual activity associated with a building or a business use, if it requires the use of city resources, and then any other criteria the mayor may deem uh, important that would fall into this category. We also list items that does not constitute what a special event may be. And then what we really did was focus on three definitions or three areas of special events. And I've highlighted them in green on the attached slide. So one is if it's a public, if it, it's an event that takes place on public property. Um, this is generally regulated by community events. So these would be your Sunfest, your boat shows, your other events, not necessarily to that scale. Um, but they would fall under this category. Uh, a special event that's held on private property is addressed differently. Um, we have to look at residential zoning, the commercial use of the event, and if it's sponsored by the DDA, the CRA, um, but there are a whole series of requirements that fall into this category. And then thirdly is the neighborhood block party, and those are events that typically take place on a street. So for either permit in section 78-152, we obviously have and will continue to require that a special event first be obtained from the city. If you're gonna be doing advertising, that an advertising permit must also be required. Um, you see here under section 78-153, the application that's required for a special event, and you see the three areas identified in the colors. So if it's a public, an, an event on public property, um, community events, Mary Pinnacks group will be reviewing that. If it's on private property as reflected in the red, that will be my department development services. And then if it's a neighborhood block party special event, that'll be regulated by the engineering department and Kevin Bulbrick's group. And again, we'll have separate requirements for each of the three categories, if you will. Um, and we'll have the um, deadlines for when the applications must be processed so we have sufficient time to review them. So today we do require, as, as noted in section 78, 154, um, we do require criteria for our review. Um, obviously the name of the applicant, description of the event, the event date and hours, if there's additional time required to set up or break down after the event, whether there will be music, estimate of attendance, whether there'll be alcohol and tents involved. So this is a sample of one that Ann Norton submitted to us earlier. Um, we are expanding that review to um, ask for other things. So again, music and expected noise. We are going to get into parking, particularly with what we're seeing on the south end of the city. Um, expanding that to also include valet parking and that how that's going to be handled. Any impact it may have on people require licenses, building permits. We're going to check zoning. Um, so we're expanding the criteria that we will be using. Um, we extend that even further. Again, one of the things we're going to focus on is proximity to resi residential districts. So with uses like 717 Forest Hill, where some of the uses there were not complying with zoning, we're gonna take a look at that. We're gonna ask for hours of operation, whether there's amplified music, um, and you see the list of things that we're going to be um, looking at. Again, a lot more specific than what we have today. Um, so the, the big issue is again, if you're having an event on private property, do we want to limit the number of events? We are suggesting somewhere in the range of two to six times within, within a 365 day period. So at the end of the presentation, we would like to have that discussion and see what the commission feels comfortable with, but staff is suggesting it should be somewhere in that range between two and six times a year. Um, if the special event is gonna take place on private property and parking is going to be involved, including valet parking, 
Um, we're going to make sure that the applicant has secured approval for the use of the right of way, whether it's a city street, whether it's a county street or FDOT. Um, if the parking is provided, we want a notarized authorization from the property owner that's dis displayed on PAPA that they have the ability and the right to use that off street parking. So as an example, I know that Ann Norton has been using the Palm Beach Day Academy to the north. Again, we'd like to better formalize that process. Um, the event itself, we're saying, can't take place more than three consecutive days, including setup and breakdown. And again, we're going to be asking for a notarized authorization from the property owner if parking is going to be provided off-site. Um, and, then, and then again, we're also going to have the rationale and um, how a special event may be denied. So we're going to get into specifics on that as well. So once again, you see the three types of special events, public property handled by community events, private property by development services, the block party by engineering. We will have application fee due dates. Um, and this has been one of our biggest challenges, particularly on the private property events. Um, in the past, we have found out about some of these events um, through Facebook. Um, applications are not always submitted to the city. So we are scrambling with one or two days notice to try to review the application um, and get it issued in time. So we, we've tried to be responsive, but what we'd like to do with these amendments is make sure that we and the neighborhood have sufficient notice when an event might take place. Um, talk about security deposits for public properties, and then we'll have um, criteria and therefore refunds, particularly for events that happen on public property. Um, and then again, for those events that um, do not follow the uh, requirements for submittal to us, we will talk about having a, a expedited fee if somebody can't comply with this or don't submit the permit to us and we find out about it because it does cause um, my department a lot of uh, a lot of scrambling to try to get the, the event permit issued in time. Um, so for the conditions of the permit, again, if it's an event that happens on private property, as, as um, Attorney Lam uh, Rothenberg mentioned earlier, we do have a requirement between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., no amplified sound, and it's the, uh, the sound measure that, that Kimberly referenced earlier. Um, must follow all city um, ordinances. Insurance obviously has to be provided. If you're selling alcohol, there's a requirement that you have the permit from the Florida Division of Alcoholic Beverages. Um, if you have tents, electrical cooking facilities, that requires a permit. If you're using the road right of way again or the valet service, you have to have the approval from either the city, the county, or FDOT, depending on the roadway. Permits must be on site. And then for the neighborhood block party, we're going to prohibit alcohol sales, DJs, um, tents, bounce houses from taking place on the actual road itself. Um, we have a new section that we want to include on violations and unpermitted events. Um, that is one of the issues, again, we, we are facing in light of the earlier discussion on the vacation rentals. Um, a lot of times um, we have situations where people just don't pull permits, they have events. Um, so we'd like to add a little bit more teeth to the ordinance and that's what we'd like to do here. Um, so again, we're going to enforce our city codes. If there are violations, they'll be presented to the special magistrate. They'll be given time to correct the violation. Each one will be individual, like, like we did at 717. Each wedding is considered a, a violation, and it's not a blanket covering all violations there. And again, we'll have language on how a permit may be revoked, and then they'll have an appeal process um, that will talk about the appeal process for an applicant who's um, special event is shut down or denied. Um, we have been working very closely with El Cid, Kevin Lawler and his team. Um, they provided comments to us on August 13th. So prior to us coming back to the city commission um, with a final draft ordinance, we will review these in more detail. Um, some of the questions that uh, were raised by El Cid are contained in this slide. Um, some of the things are things we think we can accommodate. Some may be a little bit more challenging. Um, but what is of interest is that the very last one highlighted in green that El Cid supports the limitation of six events. Again, I had discussed the two to six number. Um, they support the six events provided that um, no more than two take place within a, within a single month. 
So with that, really the two questions uh, we'd like to come out of the workshop with some discussion on is does the city want to impose a limitation? And if so, um, what should that number be when we come back to you for a final ordinance? Um, and then secondly, as we discussed in the earlier discussion on the vacation rentals, this is the language that Kimberly referenced um, that we use today outside of the downtown, again, between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., that the noise says it can't be in such a manner to be plainly audible from a distance of 100 feet from the building. Again, do we want to use this language? Do we want to go to decibel? I think in the past, the sentiment seemed to be from the commission that they wanted to continue to use this language. Um, but with that, that concludes my presentation. We've got folks from a lot of the other departments that worked on this online as well, if you have any specific questions from them. But um, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you, Rick, for that presentation. Uh, was uh, police uh, part of that discussion? Yes, they were. All right. Because that, that's, that's something that is of concern. If somebody just simply does not comply with the permit application process and holds their event, uh, should, should police, yeah, and, you know, then it then would fall upon police, I guess, just to simply go out there and shut it down, which is a use to police resources and uh, could escalate into something else. Um, but to really accomplish the spirit of the proposed language, uh, which is if you don't have a permit, you can't operate the special event. It would seem like we'd have to have some kind of uh, measure in place that would allow uh, authorized police to shut uh, shut a, an event down without uh, that was operating without a permit. And uh, that presents its own set uh, of issues. Uh, Commissioner Fox, I, I apologize. I, I see you wanted to speak and I don't know if it was on the, the previous item or on this item. Uh, it says vacation rental. So I apologize if I missed you on the previous item, but uh, you're free to, to, to ask, uh, make any comment or ask any <laughs> questions you have now. Okay, well, I do have a question about this item. Um, if, we, if we're opening up to questions for this item. Yes, yes, yes. I, I see that Anne Orton Sculpture Garden's on this list. I haven't had a chance to speak to them. You know, I didn't know that this was what part of our discussion. I guess I would like to understand a little bit more from them about the number of events. I would think that they're impacted more than than the, uh, the average private property home in this neighborhood um, because they do have a lot of events. So, um, hey, Commissioner, let me let me add that. Um, if it's an event that's related to the actual Ann Norton Sculpture Garden, that doesn't fall into the number of events. I should have clarified that earlier. Um, but if they rent their, their venue for, let's say, a wedding that's not tied to specifically to the use of Ann Norton Sculpture Garden, then that would be considered an event. But if it's something that's tied to the Ann Norton Sculpture Garden, um, we don't treat that as a special event that would fall into that list of you know, either two to six categories. Uh, okay, uh, Madam President had a question. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I actually have one question and one comment. My question is regarding some of what you were discussing earlier about the police department. I had written that down too to see if there was a way that we're notifying the police department in advance saying these special events permits have been issued this this weekend or this week or whatever. So that way the police department, if they get a call for something else, already know going into it, there's been no permit issued. So that way they don't have to go back and check, um, but just something proactive that we're releasing to PD. Do we do that? We, we, we've been doing that recently, particularly with the uh, both the Ann Norton and the 717. Part of the challenge we have is that sometimes these venues actually hire our police officers to work security for the event. Um, and it's, it's it puts the police officer in a little difficult situation at times, but um, when we do get a special event, one of the things that we ask for is, is the maximum occupancy. Um, in the case of Ann Norton, we've had situations where they've given us a number and it turned out to be a lot more people than even they anticipated. But when we see it's going to be a big event, we, we definitely let police know. Um, we talk to them about what they've described in their permit, whether it's going to be parking, valet service. Uh, we've been trying to discourage valet service on Barcelona. 
trying to accommodate all the parking either on the site itself or in some other venue um, where it's not going to impact the public street. Um, but we do contact the police and make them aware of whatever issues we anticipate may take place with that event. Thank you. And, and a comment, if I may, Mayor. Yes. Um, in regard to the feedback on limiting number of events, um, I think the intent here is to really seal, seal up what those regulations are, what defines an event, and what the order of operations need to be to have an event such as this. And so I guess to, to that end, I would think as long as we have um, organizations, private neighborhoods, whomever in compliance with that ordinance, uh, you know, I, I don't see the need to limit this specific number as long as the events are going on within regulation. If you are not following the regulations of the event, you know, I would think that that, that would start to uh, do away with your privilege of having special events. But as long as everyone is in compliance and those events are going uh, according to plan, not impacting the parking of the neighborhood, not having those uh, negative effects within neighborhoods, um, you know, as long as it, it creates a symbiotic relationship between that entity and the neighborhood, uh, if they want to have six events or 10 events, um, you know, as long as it's not impactful to the neighborhoods, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see an issue with that. Um, <clears throat> let, let me address uh, something that I, that I just heard. And, and, and I don't know if we have representatives of the police here, but I would hope that police are not authorizing, uh, overtime uh, officers to man an event that has not been licensed. So in, in other words, if there is a special event that requires a permit uh, and a permit has not been issued, I would hope that they are, that unpermitted event is not allowed to use our police department. That just seems contrary to uh, that, that boggles my mind. So is that what you suggested, Rick, is that sometimes these unpermitted events are using our police officers? I, I, I don't know for certain, Mayor. I, I just know that a lot of these events will, will hire um, police officers, and, and many times they are, in fact, permitted. Um, okay. But what happens is they just escalate into more than what anybody anticipated. Um, the parking becomes an issue. If an application says they are going to valet at this location, then what happens sometimes we find out is that what they told us in the permit is not what's happening. And they are in fact, let's say valet parking on a public street. Um, so that's a, what, I, what I think we would like to see resolved that they submit a permit to us. Um, it's, it's compliant with all our codes and more importantly, they follow what they tell us in terms of how they're going to handle the parking, if there's valet parking involved, um, the noise, the time, the hours, et cetera. Um, okay, well, two, two things. One is I like confirmation from Chief Adderley or his, his, his department that they aren't allowing uh, uniform officers to man events that are not permitted. First of all, I wanna make sure that you know, uh, officers can't get overtime for, for uh, being at an event that it is without a permit. So hopefully somebody can confirm that. And uh, then from an enforcement standpoint, um, to be, uh, if they are working at a permitted event, I guess asking them to be eyes and ears to see if the terms of that event are being met. It really puts our police department in an unfortunate position. Uh, but, I, but I don't see another way around it. I don't see another way of enforcing. Uh, and I guess it's like anything else. And you know that we, we, we ask them to enforce our, 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 our laws. And if, if this is a law, then uh, unfortunately, they are the body that is going to be called upon uh, to enforce it. Um, but I don't want uh, men and women in blue working an event that is not permitted. Uh, okay, uh, Commissioner Lambert. You Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Rick, for the presentation. I 
I tend to agree with Commissioner Schof about the number of events, but I think that's almost in a perfect world that, you know, they would be complying with all of the regulations and the policies. And I'm just a little bit leery, you know, about the enforcement of those policies and, um, you know, worried about the, um, just the feel of, of too many events in a neighborhood and the impact that it has on that neighborhood. So I, you know, I would like maybe to see this in a little bit more detail, Rick, and as you're putting it together, have some time to review it, um, talk to the residents about it as well. Um, I think that I, I'm really appreciative of the staff and the enforcement of 717 Forest Hill. That was something that um, the neighbors, the neighborhood association got out and got behind. But um, what happened in that situation is the residents really were constantly having to, I don't want to use the term police it, but I don't know what other term to use. They're constantly mm -hmm. monitoring it. And, and so much so that I think that maybe even a few may have got a little overzealous and um, now we've got some complaints from the property owner on, you know, residents, uh, you know, playing police um, and taking it a little bit too far. So I just, I just want to be careful of that balance. Um, also, how does this, it seems like we're talking about venues that, you know, may already have events that may, you know, the process for applying for event permits. What about those um, vacation rentals that we were talking about in the last item where it's a homeowner who rented it out and somebody has a party there. They obviously or maybe didn't know they had to get a permit because they were having this party without even telling the owner. What happens in that situation? Yeah, that, that's that's a little separate. I, I, I don't think you would tie that into special event. That's a separate classification and that was that's really just a, a violation of our city code. Um, so that's not something that if somebody wanted to have a venue like that, they would come in and get a special event permit. Um, that was something that in, in the specific case that Commissioner Shelf mentioned that happened a few weeks ago, um, that was a situation where the party was ongoing till 3.30 in the morning and then the gentleman who owned the home ended up calling the police um, because it escalated into something that he didn't anticipate. Um, but I, I wouldn't tie that with the special events ordinance. I would say they're two different things. Um, Madam President, you had another uh, question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I think I want to clarify because I think as we look at this, I view events at an, an entity like an Ann Norton Sculpture Garden and a 717 Forest Hill is kind of two separate things, uh, the same but different. Um, on 717, you have a residential property that's being used for commercial purposes. Um, and towards the Ann Norton Sculpture Garden, it's registered commercial purposes, but it falls within a residential neighborhood. So they, ha they have some similar flavors to them, but I think that it, I wanna make that distinct difference because what was happening at 717 Forest Hill um, did get completely out of control. And I think those are the things that we, we are here to regulate against. So is there a way um, that, and again, I'm not trying to make this too complicated, but is there a way that we could kind of have the best of both worlds that say, um, you know, your number of events won't be limited unless you are found out of compliance so many times, you know, so that way there is the ability for entities to still have weddings, private events, et cetera, things that are revenue generating and help entities go, go on about their business, um, but still protect the neighborhoods from having a nuisance. So, you know, I, I don't know if there would be language that would create that ability or, you know, you can have six events per year, but there's an appeal process if you want to have more. And that way, if you're operating within good regulation of the six events that you put on, then there shouldn't be an issue of getting approval for more events. Again, not trying to make it too complicated, but just allowing people uh, and entities that are operating within the parameters that we've set to continue to, um, you know, make the revenue that they need to keep the organ organizations going, et cetera. We, we can do that. I, I certainly like the latter recommendation where we start out with a number with an appeal to, to let them do more. Um, but I'd rather be more cautious and, and impose a limitation at first so we they can generate a track record, for lack of a better term. And if they're compliant, 
then we can allow them to move forward as opposed to not having a limitation because then we're gonna have two weddings every weekend at certain locations, which is gonna be really disruptive. Yeah, I agree with that approach as well. Let, let's put a number in uh, and give them the opportunity to, to appeal for something in excess of that number. Um, but given where many of these are located, particularly in single family um, neighborhoods, uh, I like to see a limit. Uh, the, the, the primary purpose of those neighborhoods is single family living and not to support a business. Um, Commissioner Fox, you had a comment in this area. Thank you. It was similar to um, what Commissioner Shope was mentioning, but I'm looking at the website for Ann Norton right now, and it, it's talking about the rental facilities that it's a, a membership benefit at a certain level. And so, you know, I think I really would like to talk to them about how this might impact their membership or things that have already been promised to people that might have, you know, donated at a certain level. I course understand that the neighborhood it's really a challenge with the parking for them um, but you know since I'm sort of new to this I haven't had an opportunity to actually talk to the Ann Norton about how this works for them and how this is a either a revenue generator or you know the top members that might already have you know plans in place so um, I just wanted to mention that um, you know and, and if you know it's okay if I get in touch with them and I can give you a little bit more detail about anything that they might already be planning. Yeah, I mean, nothing is etched in stone after this conversation. Whatever uh, comes to before uh, adopting any of this has got to come back before the commission. So you'll have plenty of opportunity to do your uh, research. But I, I think in terms of guidance, uh, Rick, uh, you know, and I'll just throw this out there. It sounds like what was proposed by Madam President might uh, work where we have a specific number and then a process in place for a, an appeal uh, if you want to exceed that number. Uh, okay. That works. We, we, we can draft language to that effect. That's fine. Yeah. And then in terms of your second request, the noise violation, uh, I would be one to say that let's leave the languages plainly audible. Uh, that way we don't have to worry about people trying to run around with... Uh, noise meters okay um well, that's just one person speaking commissioner lambert thank you mayor i agree and i just i really liked your comment that we work with police um as closely as we can on this i certainly don't want to make it you know where the neighbors feel like they have to be constantly calling the police um so just want to make sure that they're involved in the process and, and they know where to find out how many uh, events that that one location has already had or if they're permitted for this event. And, and I'd also Rick, like to, to make sure the police are comfortable with uh, the idea of having to shut down an event that is operating without a permit because the city code that these language, this language here certainly suggests that that would be an option. Otherwise, we wouldn't have people apply for permits. They would uh, simply uh, take their lumps later, have the event, make their money, and take their chances later. So we, we need to have a hammer in here, and the hammer is probably going to be our police department. So let's make sure they're part of that conversation. Yeah. All right. Anything else on this item? Any other questions, comments, commissioners? Uh, Mayor, yes. yes, Mayor, if I may, before we actually leave item two, I know it uh, in part address parking, uh, but uh, we do have Kevin Volbridge. I think there was a specific uh, discussion regarding uh, parking options on Monsu that somewhat related uh, to this item. So I didn't want us to just move on to three before he had an opportunity to talk about that. If well, well, let 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 because because uh, it's it's after eleven. I want to make sure we're not running out of time because we got two other items. I, I don't know how long uh, paving and, and, and the consolidated action plan. I think usually takes a lot of time. So, well, let's table parking on Monso for now, uh, and let's get to uh, items three and four. And if we have time, we can come back. But I want to make sure we we have sufficient time. I don't have to rush through the 
consolidated action plan, consolidated action plan. All right, so table parking on myself for now. 